Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again just for another day to be here and gather together as your children to study your word, to submit to your spirit. We ask that you right now help us block everything else out, cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. We ask that you help us concentrate on your word exclusively so that we can get the spiritual nutrition you want us to have this evening and that we can understand you better and bring you more glory in this life. Most of all, Father, we thank you that you sent your son out of heaven 2,000 years ago to be born from a virgin, the son of God, so that he could take our place once for all on that cross so that our debt could be fully paid through him. You did something unthinkable, Father. We ask that you help us appreciate and dwell on this and enjoy your love and grace and mercy that you performed for us. Father, please bless this message and guide us by your Holy Spirit. Help us understand what you have for us tonight. It's in Christ's precious name we pray by the power of your spirit. Amen. The Deceitfulness of Sin, Part 6. So uh, we've seen over the last week or so how the Spirit has woven the subject of judging into our series on, on sin. And uh, last Tuesday, I remember him not giving me the go-ahead to comment on, on the topic, really. I didn't say much at all after Pastor did a lot on the Sunday previous. But this time he's given me a, some permission to add some stuff and shed some light, hopefully. And when we judge wrongly, in that moment we're being deceived by sin. So it really ties into our subject on the board. This might be kind of a summary regarding judging. The deception that sin would like us to believe is that we aren't so bad ourselves and or it blinds us to seeing we are falling in the same area we're judging another. So we then become hypocrites, not judging ourselves rightly. Romans 2.1, we're going to see Matthew 7, 1 through 5, and 1 Corinthians 11.31. So we've already seen uh, the problem in Romans 2, that we have no excuse if we judge and we practice the same things. In context, Paul wasn't saying that judging was wrong, but if you're going to make a judgment, judge yourself rightly too, in integrity. And this is part of the deceitfulness of sin. It reveals how sin wants us to be biased towards ourselves. Our sin nature takes pride in itself. And our sin nature wants to be biased towards self, making exceptions for self, and willingly ignoring one's own failures so it can keep a leg up on others, at least in its own mind. Just think about that for a minute. How is sin deceiving us in the area of judging? We always compare ourselves to others. That's our sin nature doing that too. We're always comparing ourselves to one another because we want to have a leg up because we want to have our own self-esteem. We don't want to rely on God for our self-esteem. And that even causes us to be in denial, just so that we can have the impression that we have a leg up. So we don't judge ourselves rightly, let's ignore that. Let's be in denial of the fact that we're falling in the same exact area we're judging. Our sin nature wants to prove it's good enough on its own, doesn't it? Isn't that like that little thing in you that whispers? every once in a while. We all have a little religion in us, and that's a major part of the deceitfulness of sin within us. Sin is trying to convince you, yourself, are good enough in some way, or at least better than others. At least better than some others. And that's where judging is almost like a power thing if it's done the wrong way, and, and you don't examine yourself. It's to boost up self. 
and they would get hypocritical judging, which the Lord hated. So again, the point on the board regarding judging, the deception that sin would like us to believe is that we aren't so bad ourselves, and or it blinds us to seeing we are falling in the same area we're judging another. So we then become hypocrites, not judging ourselves rightly. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 7, verse 1. Matthew 7, 1. We saw in Matthew 6, Jesus warned people about performing righteousness to be noticed by men. Then in Matthew 7, he goes on to talk about hypocritical judging. This goes right along with what Paul was talking about in Romans 2. So we're not going to read Romans 2 again. You can read that again if you want to compare the two. But look at Matthew 7, 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. That sounds like a passing a sentence in judgment to me. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? In other words, you're doing the same things, right? Or worse. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Again, hypocritical judging is in view, in context like Romans 2. And on the board in 1 Corinthians 11.31, but if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. We should be looking in the mirror first of all. And then we must be careful not to judge by the appearance. And we've heard context is key in regards to these passages on judging, but also in the situations in which we judge in life. Context is key. On the board, we saw 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And here we get into a place that we cannot go as human beings on the board. We cross the line between righteous and unrighteous judging when we suppose we have the ability to judge someone else's motivation, their heart, in other words, in the absence of admission. Therein lies our human limitation. We are strictly unable to judge a person's heart. We must leave that to God alone, just like we leave vengeance to God alone and sentencing to God alone. Those are his and his alone. To judge a situation rightly, how do we do it? We must use the word of God as our standard and not cross the line by passing a sentence on somebody. We must use the word of God as our standard and do so in gentleness, right? Humility on the board. Our flesh is so trained to draw conclusions from what is seen the Bible tells us the righteous man shall live by faith, Romans 1.17. And living by faith includes the Word of God. That's where our faith comes from, right? That, that, that we would call the faith. That's our measuring stick. So let us judge with the Word of God as a measuring stick. Our only stability, our only sure footing is upon Jesus Christ, who is the Word. We've talked about how crazy and unstable the devil's world is. It just gets crazier and more unstable. It's almost like a chemical in a, you know, a science experiment, how it gets more and more unstable and eventually it explodes. Well, it's just getting more and more unstable in this world. The wonderful truth is that Jesus Christ never changes. Talk about you know, dichotomy. It's getting more and more of a, a gap between the two because Jesus, of course, never has changed or will change, but the world is getting more and more uh, volatile.
But with Jesus, we don't have to worry about uncertainty or changing boundaries. So we saw this on Sunday. No sure footing. Nothing has ever assured us. Standing directly opposite of this is the word of God, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Ask yourselves, what is more complex, the world system or Jesus Christ? The world changes so much that the secular proverb stands true. The only constant in this life or in this world is change. Jesus Christ, however, never changes. Thank God. How refreshing that is in this world to find truth. Because we know he never changes, we can actually rest upon him and his precepts. We don't have to be wondering, right? There's no ground shifting under our feet, always changing. Have to get our footing again, like the world makes us do. You know, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. But we're still in the world. We have to live in it. And so we have to adjust. But our real foundation is Christ. And that's what gets us through everything, regardless of the pressures of the world. So I was reminded of this passage uh, when we were talking about this, the last couple lessons, thinking about the perfect hope we have in Jesus Christ. The perfect hope. A hope unwavering. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 6, 17. Some of you will remember this passage. But to think we have a perfect hope, we don't have a uh, 98% hope, you know. We don't have like a really good chance that it's going to work out or that Jesus is still going to be there. We have a 100% chance, which I guess is no chance at all. Hebrews 6.17, in the same way God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge, notice this, we who have taken refuge, that's believers, would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. In other words, do it. You've already taken refuge in him, now have, be encouraged to grab hold of him and, you know, not let him go. N- know that he's not going anywhere. And then this hope in verse 19 we have as an anchor of the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I just love that phrase, an anchor of the soul. An anchor holds firm and in this case, is actually immovable. There's no storm in this world that can unhinge it. And on the board, the Spirit brought me to Jude 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. He's our anchor. Perfect, immovable. We're kept for Jesus Christ. Thank God the Lord doesn't change his mind, nor does he have an inability to keep his word. That's why our anchor is perfect. He's totally capable of keeping every promise. That's why we can rely on him as our unchangeable, perfectly faithful anchor to the soul, no matter what we're going through in this world. This world is heinous at times. It's horrible. It's wicked the things that go on right the the things that people think say and do the world system the way the system operates it's absolutely horrifying sometimes but we shouldn't be shaken because we got the big picture we've got the truth and he's immovable and as we've studied in the past he keeps us saved as we see on the board So we are able to confidently conclude the following from Sunday. 
In John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. We know Jesus Christ is the great I am from the Old Testament, and he also is said to be grace and truth in John 1, 17. So what's the inescapable conclusion? Divine truth is eternal, immutable, unchangeable. And if people are honestly seeking answers in life, and God knows the heart, this came up last week too, if people are honestly seeking the truth, the Lord will show himself to them. But the deceitfulness of sin, it deceives people into believing that Jesus did not hold all the answers. That's the uh, whisper from the world and from the sin nature, that Jesus does not hold all the answers. It constantly deceives people that if they keep trying new things in the world, they'll eventually find the answers. That's, that's the, the wheel, right? That Satan's got people on in the world. Just keep running, just keep trying, just keep looking around the corner and trying something new, and eventually you'll discover the answers to life. That's the dece deceitfulness of sin working in each person. And by the way, sin would be fine with us thinking Jesus has some of the answers. That's fine. Just like Satan would say, that's okay. He does. Very nice man, very smart man, very good man. Sounds like what a lot of religions say about him that don't accept him as Lord. As long as Satan can mix some lies, some worldly alternatives in with the truth, then he's fine with that. So that's the sin nature too. That, that's the deceitfulness of sin also. Jesus does have some of the answers. Even telling you what you want to hear. But then don't forget about this and this. Let me add these two things in because he doesn't have all the answers. Come on, no one has all the answers. That's the deceitfulness, the slipperiness of sin. So this is where you get people creating their own version of who Jesus is. And I'm not sure, but I think at least in our country, this is going on more and more than decades ago. People are creating their own version of who Jesus is. And that's where people are tricked into following their feelings or opinions of what Jesus must be like. You ever hear that? Jesus must be like this, right? Because he's loving and because he healed everybody. So he must be like this. And so without the word of God as their anchor, they throw out certain opinions based on how they see him in their own soul. So people are tricked into following their feelings, their emotions, or their opinions of what Jesus must be like. Why? So he fits into their human sensibilities without disturbing their own life and their own agenda. I want my church and I want the world too. I want my church, I go to church, I'm faithful, but look what's going on in the world. There's nothing wrong with that, et cetera, et cetera. You could think of different examples, but that's what most people want. They want, this came up last week too, they want their church, they want their religion, but they want to fit in with the world. They don't want to stir anything up. And so PC has become more and more dominant because I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want anybody to be offended with me. It's really selfishness. I don't want anyone to be offended with me, so I'm not going to tell the whole truth. Or I'm going to admit there's some truth out in the world also. They have been unknowingly trained by the world and society to fit Jesus into their concept of the world and truth, not the other way around. What, do we just, what word do we just use? Unknowingly, right? Isn't that the, the sin, the deceitfulness of sin right there? He, he gets this done. It gets this done within us without us even realizing this is what's taken place. What's taken place? through the media over the last 
few decades. How, how brainwashed can you be if you watch TV every day for 30 years? And isn't that what we've done? It sounds horrible. Like think about, you want cumulative effect, right? 365 days a year for 30 years. Do you think you might be a little brainwashed? Right? But we don't think like that because it's been so slow and subtle. It's only one day at a time, right? I'm still going to church and all that stuff. It's so slow and subtle. So that's why people are unknowingly trained by the world. They don't realize it 30 years later. I'm still the same person, quote unquote. Although if you examine your beliefs, they might be quite different than 20 years ago because the world has trained you. So sneaky, subtle. And as we know, if people refuse to go to the word for truth like we do, like some churches do, not all, if they refuse to go to the word for truth about Jesus, that's sin winning in their lives. Let me just adopt another Jesus, my version of him. That's sin winning in their lives. That's sin deceiving them, playing on their emotions even. So as came out on Sunday, our enemies do not want us to focus our attention on the deceitfulness of sin. Why? Because we're venturing in this study to discover how it works. And no enemy wants to be uncovered. We aren't being satisfied with the mere facts about sin. Anyone can kind of make a list of, or a description, or a list of sins, right? We want to know the root cause and learn its tactics. How does it operate? How does it get the best of me? What does it use? How does it talk to me, even? That's what we want to learn. So guess what? We're going to be under attack, everybody. Everybody's going to be under attack. Different ways, different means, uh, different... Um, <clears throat> Not all the same way, right? Some by people, some by system testing of some kind, some by sickness, um, some by the person closest to you, maybe. But don't be surprised. We're going to be under attack. Expect it, okay? And pray diligently for your pastor and for me as a teacher because we're going to be under attack as we go on this journey to, you know, of discovery, so to speak, on your behalves. Satan doesn't like this at all because this is what can, I'll just use the expression, put us over the top. This is what, is, what can get us to see sin for really how it operates and possibly therefore set us free from its domination and therefore bring more glory to God in our lives. So get ready. It may get pretty nasty. Who knows? But remember that so we can be patient and tolerant of one another in love as the word tells us. So think about sin this way on the board. Sin is very good at hiding its tactics from us. I was thinking about a visual like a snake in the grass. You know that expression. Why is that so deceitful? Because the snake's in the grass. It's very low to the ground, right? You can't see it coming. That's why we need the light, right? The Word of God, like shedding light on the subject. In this case, we need a really short lawnmower. Make sure we see the snake. Sin is very good at hiding its tactics from us. It doesn't want to be discovered. It's so deceptive, it's able to fly under the radar. That's why the snake is the perfect picture that God's given us. Without the Word of God shedding light on how it works... None of us will see or understand its tactics. It doesn't matter how smart you are intellectually. As came out on Sunday, picture the Word of God as a massive floodlight. Think about criminals sneaking around at night, trying to break into a house in the pitch dark. And all of a sudden, the brightest of floodlights is directly upon them. There's no way to go. And you see them for who they are, right? That's how the Word of God can save us from deception. It makes things very clear and no longer hidden from view. 
So our only hope to be rescued from deception is to literally cling to the word of God with all our heart. All right, just please listen carefully. Just think about this. You know, you're here listening to the word of God. You're doing the right thing. You're submitting to the word. You don't always feel like being here. You're, you're human. We have bad days. We're tired, etc. But just think about this for a minute. Our only hope of being rescued from being deceived by sin is literally clinging to the word of God with all our heart and relying on the spirit to show us what we're not getting. Hold on to the word and don't let it go. So, for example, right? Oh, microphone. I'm holding on to this Bible real close right now, right? This is how we should be thinking about the word of God in our souls. This is how we should value the word of God in our souls. This should be our attitude toward the word of God like this. I have a photo from India of an old lady, old Indian woman, believer, who's hugging her Bible like this to her chest with a nice peaceful smile on her face. But you know what? That's how close we need the word of God to us, to not be deceived. That's the attitude of your soul. And maybe you need to submit in that area to God. That you need the word. It's not like optional and it's not a nice to have. You need the word or you're going to be deceived by sin. The floodlight won't be on and the snake in the grass won't be seen. So have this attitude. I need the word of God to survive, to not be taken captive by the enemy. When's the last time you thought about the word of God in that uh, you know, dramatic reality, I guess. I need the word of God just to survive and not be taken captive. As I was reviewing my notes, I thought of the Greek word for devotion that I couldn't remember last week, but it fits perfectly here. What did it mean? Persevering affection. Think of that old Indian woman hugging her Bible. Not a nice to have, not a should have. Persevering affection. Without that attitude toward the word of God, we will eventually be deceived. Because Satan's working us, on us out there every single day from all different angles and formats. Unless we adopt that attitude for ourselves, we will be taken captive one day by the deceitfulness of sin. We're unable to avoid deception and, and captivity on our own. Even if you have... 30 years into the Word of God, let's say, and then you decide to give it a break because maybe you think you know everything. Maybe you think you have enough, and there's something you've always wanted to do, you know, in the world. You've always wanted to try, and so the Word of God goes on the shelf for a while. You too, O brilliant one, will be deceived because the world is pecking away at you and you don't even know it. And you're watching TV every day and you don't even realize what you're listening to and accepting. The word of God's our only protection. Then on Sunday, the Spirit got very practical with us. How does sin go undetected? Sin's greatest strategy is to flip everything around in our souls. This came out on Sunday. Sin's greatest strategy is to flip everything around in our souls. On the board, regarding sin strategy. Get them to be persuaded by the world's wisdom to call evil good and good evil and to call darkness light and light darkness. We saw that in Isaiah 5.20 and Matthew 6.23. If Satan can, over time, with much inculcation by the world system, get us to do this, then sin will dominate us and we won't even know it. Given enough time, without the word of God, we will flip, at least in some areas of our lives. We'll call darkness light and light darkness, good evil, evil good, and we won't even know we're doing it anymore. I think of some relatives of mine that I know are doing it, that years ago, let's say 20, 30 years ago, they wouldn't have thought what they think now about certain things. But they've been flipped over time not in the Word of God, and brainwashed by the world system. 
Go to uh, Matthew 6.22 again. Again, on the board, sin strategy, get them to be persuaded by the world's wisdom to call evil good and good evil, to call darkness light and light darkness. If Satan can, over time, with much inculcation by the world system, get us to do this, sin will then dominate us and we won't even know it. Matthew 6.22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is, is darkness, how great is the darkness? You don't even realize it. You think it's light. Again, the question is, how does sin go undetected? Part of flipping everything is getting us to develop wrong definitions about things. As Pastor mentioned on Sunday, sin poses as a friend as something good or even righteous for us. It's the slippery tongue convincing us, deceiving us, telling us the things we want to hear, and then slipping the lies in. That's how he gradually gets us to believe false definitions. And these false definitions aren't obvious. They're often subtle changes, small lies added to truth. For example, the lie that there's never a proper time or way to judge rightly. Over time, that lie crept in. That defini definition got changed. On the board, again regarding sin strategy, sin lures us into a conversation in our own heads introducing personal opinions and worldly standards as possible substitutes for the pure truth of the Word of God. Have you ever had to snap yourself out of going down a negative rabbit hole in your mind? Is it, has there been one day you didn't have to do that? I just did it the other day and I started, you know, I heard something from somebody, I can't remember if it was on TV or not, but I heard something from somebody and my mind started to entertain, maybe that is true. And then it started to go down a rabbit hole, which inevitably doubts part of the Word of God. And I had to shake it off. And I had to catch myself, right? Sin is slippery and sneaky and will whisper sweet nothings in your ear. It's going to sound very sweet and very tempting. Sin will approach you as your friend and convince you to satisfy your flesh by seducing you into various forms of adultery. Notice I said various forms. The Bible uses literal adultery as a good visual aid of falling for the seductiveness of sin. It's a trap, like a Venus flytrap. Falling for the smell and the beauty and then being bitten and consumed. That's what the serpent did in the garden, isn't it? He lured Eve in with a friendly approach and sweet speech, giving the impression he was looking out for her best interests. That's the deceitfulness of sin. It's almost like you got, you know, the good guy and the bad guy in the shoulder, right, whispering to you, but the bad guy's pretending to be the good guy. Don't forget that part of it. It's not obvious. He's not obvious. So again, on the board, sin lures us into a conversation in our own heads even, introducing personal opinions and worldly standards as possible substitutes for the pure truth of the Word of God. If you've ever said to yourself about anything in life, well, it's not that bad, what did you just say? Sounds like you've been deceived in some area and you're justifying something. If you say it's not that bad, you just admitted it's some bad. Didn't you? And we all do that. I mean, we all, we all do that. So where does that come from? The seductiveness of sin has convinced you something is not that bad. 
It's the little things, isn't it? Hint, hint. Go to Proverbs 5, 3. Proverbs 5, 3. Be on guard. It's the little things. <clears throat> and it's not the obvious things. Nine out of ten times. Proverbs 5, 3. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. If a person thinks he can control a tempting situation, right there is more deception from his sin nature. He will, given enough time, be seduced and consumed by it. And that's why we've been hearing from the Spirit, don't even play with fire. Don't even mess with it. This is why Jesus was so direct and dogmatic in Matthew 18, 9. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. In other words, don't even play with fire. Just throw it out of your life, whatever it is. And this reminded me of 1 Corinthians six eighteen on the board, <clears throat> where Paul says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. What's the solution to immoral temptations? There's only one. Flee. That's it. Flee. There's no reasoning with it. There's no trying to outsmart it. There's no uh, tolerating it and saying you're doing it out of love. <laughs> trying to be patient in a, with somebody, right? When you know you're in a, a situation of temptation. The Bible says flee. Don't even hang around. Any delaying could cause death. That might seem a little extreme, but there are many forms of death in the Bible. And the Bible says sin leads to death. So run. This is why some of you, and I'm not sure why the Spirit's bringing this up, but he, he you know, put this, inserted it into my notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is why some of you had to separate from certain people in your lives, and it couldn't be gradual. Or maybe you're in that situation right now. You knew they were bringing you down, even if they didn't intend to. You knew you had to protect your own soul, so you cut them out of your life. Sometimes that's the only way to do it, to protect your own soul. And when new temptations come into our lives, if it's something we can't just cut out of our lives in a, in a simple way, the Bible tells us to resist him, and he will flee from us. We're told to resist temptation, and as we've seen, that starts with watching where we step in the first place. So the Spirit wanted me to repeat something from A.W. Pink from the last two lessons on the board. Get, try to get the visual. We are expressly told that there is no lion in the way of holiness, that no ravenous beast shall be found there. If you read Isaiah 35, 8 and 9, you'll see that's what it says. No, we have to step out of that way, talking about God's way, and trespass on the devil's territory before he can get an advantage of us, as in 2 Corinthians 2.11. It's really like the Wizard of Oz, and that had a, a Christian message to it. You'll be safe and protected if you just stay on the yellow brick road. Satan can't come onto the yellow brick road. He doesn't want to. He's just waiting for you to step off one or two steps, and he'll lure you five or six steps, and then maybe he's got you. That's why the Bible talks about the narrow path, right? And then Pink goes on to con continue. That is why we are so emphatically enjoined, enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. Proverbs 4, 14 through 15. Don't even step off the path onto the other path. So here's another repeat from the Spirit that he wanted me to give you and comment on. 
regarding playing with fire. Sin deceives us into thinking that we can play with fire and not get burned. The truth is that eventually, given the superior nature of fire, we get burned. We sin. The best strategy is to avoid it, back away, and the Bible says resist. And we've already seen these verses. Ephesians 6.13, James 4.7, and 1 Peter 5.8 and 9. We are to resist and to stand firm in the faith. And the devil will flee from us. So says Holy Scripture. It almost seems a little too easy. I mean, I don't have to fight back or, you know, get on the offensive. I, you want me to resist? You want me to stand firm in the faith? And he'll run? Yep. Isn't that great news? And that's also the reason we're not to live in fear of the devil. That's not what God wants. God says, if you stay on my path, if you stay on the narrow path, you're protected. If you cling to my word, no, that's a hard issue. But if you make the decision to submit, if you cling to my word, you'll be protected. The word is far more powerful than Satan and his deceptions or your sin nature. So we're not called to beat him or challenge him face to face with a sword. Just resist him, standing firm in the faith. Maybe the Bible says this because he can't control or violate our free will. Maybe that's why he flees when we resist. He'll go find an easier target. Because he can't violate our free will. And if we stand firm in the truth, what's he going to do? What can he do? But nevertheless, the Bible says he will flee from us if we just simply resist him in his temptations. So the message from the Spirit is don't play his game. Don't play with fire. Resist even getting close to it. As Pastor was saying on Sunday, right? The path over there to the temptation is over there, so you literally walk around it the other way. If we're smart, that's the way to beat it. As I was enjoying the last couple lessons with my hot tea and my Kleenex, a couple particular, a particular passage came to mind that I taught years ago regarding playing with fire, and I wanted to share it with you. So please turn, you're in Proverbs 5 right now, right? So go to Proverbs 6, verse 20. And the teaching goes on about the adulteress. Proverbs 6, 20. My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. Do you see how there's a clinging to the word of God here? That's a protection. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. I, was, I thought it was pretty cool. I was, I was reading that this morning. But that's the word of God actively keeping you and protecting you. For the commandment, verse 23, the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light. Remember the floodlight, how the word reveals the deceptions. The commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light. And reproofs for discipline are the way of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. So there we have it. Don't even play with fire. You can't do it and not get burned. This truth doesn't apply only to this type of physical adultery. Adultery against God is any kind of cheating on God with the world or the world's ways. So open your mind a little bit, even though this is a wonderful visual example in Proverbs 6. 
regarding spiritual adultery. And this is a big question here in the bold for all of us. Are you lusting after other things in the world that you allow to take the place of the Lord himself, satisfying your heart and soul? We're all guilty of this in some area. I mean, unless you're resurrected and you have a, you know, no more oaths in nature. Are you lusting after other things in the world that you allow to take the place of the Lord himself, satisfying your heart and your soul? Are you looking for other things to satisfy your soul instead of looking to him? Money, maybe, possessions, power, sex, control, reputation, etc., etc. Are you looking to anything? I mean, be honest. This, this is a painful question, I guess. But if you're honest, you know, that's when we can be set free. What are you looking to, might be the better question, to satisfy the void in you instead of looking to the Lord to satisfy you? Lusting after the things found in the world are a form of playing with fire, and they all have painful consequences. And I wrote this in my notes as I was listening on um, Sunday, I guess. Stop your suffering ways. We're so stupid, aren't we? We know it ends in suffering every time of some kind when we fall for temptation. That's what Proverbs uh, 6, 27 to 29 says. We won't go unpunished when we play with fire. Lusting after the things found in the world are a form of playing with fire, and they all have painful consequences. We know this because we've all experienced it, right? Pursuing these things in our hearts all result in painful consequences every time. So don't think of adultery as only physical in nature. This is part of the deceitfulness of sin. That's the easy one, right? That's the one you can put on a list. Murder, adultery, blah, 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 blah. I'm done. I haven't done those. I'm good. How about the other five ways you cheated on God with the world? I don't want to look at that. That's, that's not on my list, right? It's inconvenient. As came up on Sunday, and listen carefully. Again, this is a really good thing to think about. It may be that something is not wrong for another person, but it's wrong for you. For example, the same exact thing, which might not be sin in itself, might be something that bothers or entices your soul. But it doesn't bother the soul of your friend. It might be a trigger for you towards sin, but not for another person. Sunday's message made me think about this direct statement of Scripture on the board. 2 Peter 2.19, Part B. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. And we're all different, aren't we? We're all built differently. Uh, we're all uniquely made by God, wonderfully made. We all have different weaknesses. By whatever man is overcome by this, he is enslaved. So it's going to be something different for each of us. This is stated by Peter after he describes the lustful lifestyles of unbelievers and how they try to convince you to run with them. And then Peter said this, it's a very plain conclusion, worthy of our consideration. Again, on the board, for by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. So I'm going to use a silly example to lighten the mood a little bit for all this adultery talk. Let's say you like donuts. Is there anything wrong or sinful about eating a donut? May it never be, right? Some of you are like, no way. We can't find any scripture against it. Now, don't get hung up that it's not really good for you or that it sits in your stomach for four days without digesting. Don't let that bother you. You like your occasional donut. Good stuff. As long as it doesn't consume you. But your friend is consumed by donuts, like obsessed. He has to have multiple donuts every day 
and he even sneaks out of the house lying to his wife to go get another donut. He might have a problem, right? Might that be sin to him? It's only donuts, right? Might that be sin to him? Not because the act itself is sinful, but because he is overcome by it, as Peter would say. Now, this could be anything good in our lives. This could be anything that's not sin in itself. A donut is not sin in itself, right? So whatever your donut is, it could be, quote-unquote, good or nothing wrong with it. But this is part of the deceitfulness of sin. Sin will say, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a donut. Have ten more. That's okay. Don't worry about it that it obsesses you and your, your bank account is empty because you keep buying donuts. And your wife, you know, you lie to your wife. She thinks you're in adultery, but you're really, you know, cheating on her with donuts. I don't know. <laughs> but seriously, it could be anything that is harmless in, your, in life by appearance. And we abuse it. We become enslaved to it. And therefore, it becomes sin to us. Why? And here's the key point I think the Spirit's making. We are in our soul relying on it for our happiness and satisfaction as opposed to the Lord himself. Back to the question we had earlier. We're relying on it, whatever it is, for our happiness and satisfaction as opposed to the Lord himself. So someone could be cheating on God with something as harmless as a donut. You get the point. But your donuts could be anything. Could be television, movies, games, social media addiction, sports, food, drink, on the board. Sin would love you to rationalize any addiction as no big deal. It's only a donut. Are you serious? You Bible thumper. It's a donut. You're saying I'm sinning because I'm having too many donuts? Sin would love you to rationalize any addiction as no big deal. But it is sin if it becomes a substitute for the Lord as your hope and your peace. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's television and movies. Like, I don't know, maybe some people listen to music eight hours a day and they can't, they can't not have something, you know what I'm trying to say? Something's always got to be on. TV, radio. Are you relying on that for your hope and your peace? Maybe you're not. I don't know. But if you are, you're trying to make a substitute to give you peace in your soul and whatever, to calm you down or whatever. When the Lord wants to be that for you. He's a jealous lover. He wants to be that for us. So if you have an addiction, whatever it is, if you're overcome by something, as Peter would say, just admit it. Because you're only fooling yourself, right? Not fooling God, that's for sure. He knows if your heart is preoccupied with something for contentment and peace and satisfaction instead of Him. And let's close with this passage in uh, 1 Corinthians 6.12. <clears throat> Peter said, for by, what, by whatever a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. But we are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been bought with a price, his blood. 1 Corinthians 6.12 Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. See, Paul knew that was the sign that something is overboard in your life. It might be lawful, but if it's mastering you, that's sinful, really. You, you become a slave to something in the world. And then look what he starts with. Food. Huh. Pretty good for us Americans, isn't it? Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know 
that your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. That's where God wants our heart and soul to be. Clinging to him as the only hope, the anchor of our soul. Again, verse 17, the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. So, verse 18, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you, you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Many times, it's the little things that take us away from God. And maybe you don't think about spiritual adultery. Maybe you don't think that you're cheating on God by submitting to certain addictions. But you are. Read the blog again. It's a wonderful view into how sin deceives us even. Sin often uses the little things that are quote-unquote no big deal or not that bad. We must not rationalize along with sin about things that take us away from relying on the Lord. Again, we must not rationalize along with sin about things that take us away from relying upon the Lord. That's exactly what sin wants you to do, even regarding things that may not be sin in themselves. So, a little more view into the strategy and the deceitfulness of sin. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for your patience with us, uh, teaching us gradually and in a loving, patient way, as only your Spirit can do. We ask, Father, that you help us be humble before you and your word and realize we need to cling to your word to be rescued from the deceitfulness of sin and its strategies. Father, help us apply these things to our lives. Help us share these things with others so that they can look at the big picture and see what's really going on in the world and even in their own souls. We ask these things in Christ's precious name, and it's by the power of your Spirit we pray. Amen.